Welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a few minutes, just letting people join in. Thank you for joining us tonight. I think we'll go ahead and get started and people can continue to join in. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Judy Barton and I'm with Healthcare for All Minnesota. Um, thank you for coming to our spring quarterly meeting and update on what's going on currently in healthcare financing reform. Um, we have a very jam packed evening tonight. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. I do ask that everyone please mute yourself um, just so that there's no background noise. And um, with that, I'm gonna hand over the call or the webinar to Ann Jones. Ann? Hello, good evening, and welcome to our Healthcare for All Minnesota and Physicians for a National Health Program Minnesota quarterly meeting, March 9th, uh, 2023. Um, thanks, Judy uh, Barton, our Healthcare for All Minnesota Director of Operations, and Jen Crawford, PNHP Minnesota Executive Director, for hosting this evening. Um, and I'm Ann Jones, a retired registered nurse and vice chair for Healthcare uh, for All Minnesota. So again, uh, welcome. As we as people continue to sign in, I'll just go over our agenda for this evening. We are going to start out this evening with a welcome and remarks from incoming Healthcare for All Minnesota Board Chair Rose Roach. Um, our guest speaker is uh, second year medical student Allison Leopold. More about Allison uh, in a few minutes. And uh, then we will go to a fundraising appeal from PNHP Minnesota Executive Director and an overview of healthcare, health policy related activities at the Capitol from Rose. And then a quick update on our City Council Resolutions Project from Dave Garibaldi. I have some announcements and Judy and I will end with two calls to action to move us in the direction uh, we need to go uh, on this issue. So first on our agenda, we're going to hear from incoming chair um, of Healthcare for All Minnesota, Rose Roach. Uh, Rose is also serving as the national coordinator for the labor campaign for single payer, which offers us a great contact with, um, with uh, the labor movement in Minnesota on this issue. Um, Rose, go ahead. Great, thank you, Anne, and good evening, everyone. I am really pleased to be attending the first quarterly meeting of 2023 as your new chair for uh, Healthcare for All Minnesota. I think most of you know me uh, from my position as the executive director of the Minnesota Nurses Association. I retired from MA on January 31st after 34 years in the labor movement here in Minnesota and in California. Of course, retirement for me was never going to mean that I would actually um, not stay engaged in the healthcare justice movement. So not only has Anne is mentioned, have I taken on this role as chair of healthcare for all Minnesota, but I am also the national coordinator for the labor campaign for single payer. And that is an organization that is dedicated to moving labor to the forefront of the healthcare justice movement to win Medicare for all. Uh, as my friend and someone I bet a number of you also know, Peter Ratchcliffe, a retired uh, labor history professor from McAllister College said to me, there is no retiring from the class struggle. And I think uh, he is exactly right about that, it would seem. So I want to take a moment too to thank Dr. Mark Brocky, HCAM's chair these past few years. Dr. Brocky has been a wonderful leader of this organization, and we all owe him a debt of gratitude for moving the organization forward in so many ways, not the least of which is expanding affiliate partners, thinking creatively about both securing funding and effective ways in which to use that funding and allowing space for important support building campaigns like garnering seven city council resolutions across the state in support of the Minnesota Health Plan and Medicare for All. Thank you, Dr. Brocky. I look forward to our continued work together as we take HCAM to the next level. 
Speaking of taking HCAM to the next level, the HCAM board will be participating in a leadership planning session in late April with a focus on building the campaign to win the Minnesota Health Plan. In doing so, we will be sending out a member survey to get your thoughts and ideas on what our successes have been to date, what challenges we continue to face, what questions we should be asking, and what's on the near horizon that we should be thinking about tackling. I am also envisioning a restructuring of HCAM to improve efficiency and effectiveness to be the hub of the statewide campaign to win the Minnesota Health Plan. As, as HCAM is a volunteer organization, other than our one amazing part-time staff member, Judy Barton, the Director of Operations, I want us to be thoughtful in thinking about ways to engage all of our HCAM members in the work of winning guaranteed health care for all, no exceptions, so as not to overburden any one of us, but to share in the work and the rewards that will come with it. As I reflect on the tremendous work that HCAM has accomplished to date, I am particularly proud of the Health Justice Allies Coalition, the diverse coalition of unions and organizations that are helping prioritize healthcare justice while supporting each other's work. An example of this just happened this morning at the HCAM board meeting, wherein our new board member who is here with us tonight, Carolina Ortez, who is the Associate Executive Director of COPAL, a member-based organization that is leading social impact initiatives to improve the quality of life for Latin American families, informed us that Senate File 466, called the Frontline Communities Protection Act, which would create stronger permitting requirements for facilities that are seeking permission to emit pollutants into environmental justice areas and would require the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to evaluate existing pollution in an area when issuing a new permit, permit is a priority bill for our partners at COPAL. We are all too familiar with the impacts of the social determinants of health, including the impact of climate change and pollution, and we know that environmental justice is racial justice, it's economic justice, and it is, in fact, healthcare justice. Therefore, the HCAM board voted unanimously this morning to endorse Senate File 466. This intersectional work within the broader social justice movement is critically important. We will never get health care for all when communities of color and tribal lands are allowed to be poisoned with pollutants and groundwater contamination. We will never get health care for all when transgender people's very existence is being threatened across this country every single day. We'll never get health care for all when the working class just struggles to get by while the ruling class does everything in their power to divide us. Our very humanity is at stake. We must strive to put aside our different differences, find common ground, and stand in solidarity with one another. I'm very excited to work together with you to create that coalition of what the nurses would say is a coalition of care, compassion, and community. Another initiative I'm proud of is the work done by HCAM last November and December to get in front of our elected officials. By that I mean the decision to tell them what we want, not wait for them to tell us what they plan to do. Doing so has brought about some of the strongest healthcare infrastructure bills we've seen in Minnesota for decades. It's clear there is less fear of the medical industrial complex as our legislators directly take them on and call them out for their immoral business strategies that have little to nothing to do with healthcare strategies. I'll explain more about that work during the legislative report later in the evening. And even more exciting than the legislative report is what we will hear and learn from our keynote speaker tonight, Allison Leopold, a med student and leader of Students for a National Health Program, the student arm of Physicians for a National Health Program. These dedicated student organizers are the future of our healthcare system and this movement. They are giving me life on a daily basis, and we are in for a real treat tonight. So again, welcome to the first quarterly HCAM meeting of 2023. Please remember that it is our responsibility to amplify the issue of how our complicated, fragmented, costly, and harmful healthcare marketplace is failing public health providers and patients. 
It is also our responsibility to raise up the voices of those most negatively impacted and marginalized, to take our lead from them and bring them forward. I can think of, I can't think of a better, more committed group of activists to take on that task as the members and staff of HCAM. As I always like to say when ending my re remarks, in the words of the great labor leader, organizer, and um, leader, Dolores Huerta, si se puede, yes, we can. Thank you, everyone. You say pointing. Um, okay. Uh, Rose has uh, prefaced our um, guest speaker for this evening. I want to introduce to you Allison Leopold, second year medical student at the University of Minnesota. Allison completed the summer intern program with Physicians for a National Health Program. Uh, last year and is an active member of the University of Minnesota chapter of Students for a National Health Program, SNAP. She plans to practice addiction medicine with hopes of, of improving not only the quality of care in that specialty, but also access to addiction care with a universal single payer financing for health care system in the U.S. Allison recently worked with other student activists to organize and stage a rally on the campus in opposition to this proposed merger between Sanford Health and Fairview Health Services. Also, the proposed uh, building of an expensive new facility by the university, uh, pushed by the dean of the medical school and president of the university. More to, um, to learn about that um, another time. But Allison, go ahead. I'll take my slides down and let you uh, bring yours up. Thanks, Anne. And thank you, Rose. I appreciate the McAllister shout out, Rose, as a McAllister 2020 alum myself. I love that. Okay, I'll go ahead and share my slides here. Okay, can everyone see that? Great. So, um, like Anne said, uh, I'm part of SNAP, which is Students for a National Health Program. Um, and I was asked to talk uh, primarily about the rally that we recently hosted. Um, but as just a little bit of an outline today, um, I'm going to talk about our events leading up to the rally and sort of the connections we've been building and, and the tools that we had uh, to be able to make the rally happen. And then um, I'll talk about organizing the rally itself. And then we'll talk a little bit about moving forward after the rally and what's next for SNAP. So before we jump in, I wanna just highlight three key learning points from our advocacy efforts this year. Uh, and the first is that we really learned as an organization how to use our connections. And this will come up over and over, but um, we really cap, I don't wanna say capitalized in this group. Uh, we learned how to uh, utilize our connections across a whole bunch of different sectors. Um, and I'll point this out when this comes up, but this was pervasive. We also learned how to seize the moment. So we said yes to a lot of things and then figured out how we were gonna do them later. Um, so basically anytime we were offered something or asked to do something, we just said, yes, absolutely. And then we figured it out privately <laughs> separately because we didn't really know how yet, but we knew we had to say yes. And then um, the third was that we really wanted to make our advocacy and, and just joining the movement fun and easy. And we wanted to make an on-ramp for students to join in on this movement without having to prepare, without having to stress about researching things. Like SNAP can take on the research, SNAP can take on the preparation, but we wanted students to feel empowered to just show up at our rally, at hearings at different um, advocacy events and just feel like they were going to hang out with their friends and it was going to be a really fun time to join in on the movement. So these were our three key learning points and these will come up uh, throughout sort of the story I'll be telling tonight. So this story starts with the PNHP summer internship. As Anne mentioned, I completed this in the summer alongside um, a couple of the folks here and um, some other people who aren't pictured. But this PNHP internship was fundamental in just laying the groundwork for our education. Um, we were able to actually gain the tools to engage in this movement. We learned with just like so much more depth of expertise about like what single payer healthcare really means. Um, these are photos from us presenting our final projects that we had worked on all summer uh, with John Marty in the middle, <laughs> shout out. Um, and it also set up the connections for us to be able to just hit the ground running. So. It was the PNHP internship and Jen Crawford that ultimately like connected us to the health justice allies, which is why we're here. It's 
um, it's here that we learned more about the MNA and connected to folks in the MNA and more people in PNHP and just more people around the movement. So building the knowledge and gaining connections was really fundamental um, with the PNHP summer internship. So that was a great starting point. And then moving along our timeline, uh, our first event in the fall, so after the summer internship, was our Patients Over Profits Single Payer Healthcare 101 event, where we invited Senator Marty to campus, um, and we gave what was hopefully a very accessible talk about single payer. And we wanted this event to serve as the way that students could easily engage with what single payer actually is, because our education on it in the medical school is not good. <laughs> um, and so... We wanted to present it in a really digestible, understandable way. I used a lot of cartoons in my talk. Uh, and then we wanted Senator Marty to be there to answer anyone's questions. And then at the end of the event, students could come to the front of the room and we collected their emails, we collected their phone numbers, people who were excited got to be more involved in the org. And that was a really good way to set up our year of advocacy. And then uh, we went to the National SNAP Conference in Boston. Uh, so this is a picture of a couple of our board members, me and Vineet and Romy. And then if anyone recognizes Dr. John Crossan, who's the uh, who's done PNHP for Minnesota and also our pathology professor. <laughs> um, and so we all went to the SNAP Conference and we learned a lot about advocacy and uh, we were able to expand our connections nationally. So we were connecting with other students in SNAP chapters across the country. Ironically, I actually met a couple more doctors from Minnesota at the conference in Boston uh, who were involved in the movement, some of whom ended up donating to our rally later on. So this was a key point in just networking and building connections amongst Minnesotan doctors too. Uh, but it was really exciting to meet other students involved in this movement. It gave us a lot of energy and we learned skills like, like basic organizing skills. Like uh, if you have an ask and your target doesn't respond appropriately, then you escalate and you can bring in these organizations and you can pool people together like this and this and this. And so we were learning all those uh, skills at this conference, which was really exciting and came in handy later on. And then moving on in our timeline, again, we participated in the Medical Student Day of Action. Um, and so basically this event was hosted by a large conglomerate of student organizations in the medical school. Uh, and we had our little table with the HCAM um, petition for single payer that students were signing on to. And then uh, I, I wanna just highlight this idea of a medical student day of action. I think it, it shows that medical students are really engaged in legislative act activism, in community building. Um, so many organizations, even ones that you wouldn't really necessarily think of, who are really involved in this Medical Student Day of Action. So we're pictured here at the table with the Orthopedic Surgery Interest Group, and they had legislative action points that they wanted students to sign on to. The Emergency Med Interest Group was there. Asian Pacific American Student Association was there. Neurodiversity, Addiction Med, Pride in Healthcare, like so many different organizations signed on to this event. Uh, so we had a lot of signatures, and we also just built a lot of energy around activism amongst the med school class. And then we also collaborated with White Coats for Black Lives. So the, the executive boards for White Coats for Black Lives and uh, Students for a National Health Program are almost completely merged. We have a lot of overlap. Uh, students are very involved in both of those orgs. So the collaboration there was pretty seamless. And we hosted a session called Abolition Medicine and Racial Capitalism. Uh, so White Coast for Black Lives has a series of teach-ins that a lot of us are involved with, and this was just one of those teach-ins. Uh, but we were talking about like ways that we can practice healthcare outside of structures of capitalism, and we brought up single payer as a way to sort of dissociate um, corporate healthcare, which is so pervasive in our current system, as you know, but dissociate that from the healthcare that we want to be practicing and uh, imagine futures that that uh, involve that sort of disentanglement of capitalism from healthcare. And so we explained what single payer is, and then we broke out into small groups, which you can see in these photos. Um, and Miranda was in charge of the small groups. Okay. Miranda is one of our board members as well. Um, and she she says that in these small groups was where she really felt like people were starting to like really engage with single payer. They were able to ask their questions, uh, the questions that I'm sure all of you get all the time, um, but we don't have a lot of space for them as students. Um, and they were able to just like be in this peer to peer environment and really understand finally <laughs> what single payer is about and why we're all so excited about it. 
So she says that this was a key event for her, especially I was leading the big session, so I didn't hear the small groups. Um, but as a small group facilitator, she said that this was really important in in getting people on board with single payer. And then we have the Fairview Sanford merger. <laughs> so there comes a time when Fairview and Sanford announce that they're going to merge. And the initial step taken by medical students was actually not directed by SNAP. It was um, a couple of medical students voicing concerns about uh, not necessarily what, what SNAP would have put at the, the forefront of our concerns, but definitely very valid concerns. So um, they wrote a letter that outlined things like their concerns about access, access to reproductive health care under a Sanford system, access to gender affirming care under a Sanford system. They didn't talk a whole lot about um, sort of the healthcare economics that SNAP thinks about, like they didn't talk about increasing out-of-pocket costs for patients and stuff like that, but they raised some really valid and important concerns. Um, and that letter got 200 signatures, which was great. The dean saw it and the dean responded in a way that um, SNAP was not particularly satisfied with. Uh, he basically said, don't worry, we're gonna build a new hospital. <laughs> And SNAP said, that is not a solution. <laughs> so just like what we learned at the National SNAP conference, we learned, okay, when you have an ask and your target doesn't respond, you escalate. So the dean responded and SNAP escalated. And this is when we started coordinating our rally. Um, we wrote a second letter that outlined, that thanked the original students for their concerns and then added more concerns like closure of rural hospitals, uh, increased out-of-pocket costs for patients, things like that. Um, and we started in that letter, we like, um, invited people to this rally and started coordinating that rally. Uh, and it was about, I think it was Tuesday before we wanted to host the rally on Friday. It was primarily me and Miranda at this point, um, just coordinating it. We were about to send the email to invite people. And then we were like, huh, you know, I wonder what we're going to do at the rally when everyone gathers in one spot. We actually don't really know what the plan is and we actually have never planned something like this and we don't really know what we're doing and it's at that point that i called rose and i said rose please help us out we actually are in way over our heads and we don't know what's going on and this is when mna gets involved and rose says honey i'm gonna get you a meeting with mna this week we're gonna lend you our sound system we're gonna help you out we have people whose full-time jobs it is to coordinate things like this. And we're gonna make it happen with you. We've got your backs. I cannot even tell, like I cried that night. <laughs> it's like, thank God for Rose. So MNA gets involved and we start coordinating this rally and I'll get into the details of that. But before I do, um, what was really exciting is that because MNA was involved and they weren't officially involved because of uh, union rules, I just wanna give them credit in this space. Um, but because MNA, was helping us out with it, um, they also were able to loop us into some of the legislative pieces. And so they asked us to testify at the hearing at the House uh, in opposition to the Fairview Sanford merger. And this was one of those moments <laughs> where we just said yes and then figured out how we were going to make that happen afterwards. So we said, absolutely, we'll testify, even though we've never testified at anything before. And we don't exactly know what we're doing, but we're going to write something and we're going to send it to MA and see if they like it <laughs> and if they can give us ethics. And so that's what we did. Um, and we ended up testifying in front of the house. I was one of the speakers. And then we had a bunch of SNAP students there in solidarity. Um, we testified in support of Representative Bierman's bill, which would um, put a lot of uh, more government control over big mergers like this. Um, and of course, just were very vocal against the Fairview Sanford merger. And these are some photos from that day. Um, and so we had... <laughs> Uh, one of our Instagram posts was all of our SNAP friends testifying at the Capitol today. So just once again, trying to make it fun and easy and make it look like, hey, if you come with us to the Capitol next time, you're going to have a bunch of fun with all of your friends um, so that people really want to join on, you know. Uh, and then what was uh, really exciting is that we also had an article in the Star Tribune, which we were able to leverage for our press release for the rally and say, hey, Fox, hey, CBS, hey, Minnesota Reformer. We just had an article in the Star Tribune and med students are really mad about this merger and we're hosting a rally on Friday. We think you should be there. So that was great. It was a perfect setup. Um, and yeah, it was just really exciting to be able to testify. Um, and then I want to talk a bit about actually planning the rally itself. So 
we knew that we needed an organizing team. We had MA supporting us, they had our backs, but we also knew we needed a lot of hands on deck. So this is one of those moments we just used our connections and we texted 20 of our medical school friends. We put them all in a group chat and we started assigning roles. We said, you're gonna shovel snow, you're gonna man the, the check-in desk, <laughs> you're gonna, um, you know, you're gonna be a marshal, all these different roles. If they couldn't make it, if they couldn't make the rally, we figured they would let us know. But we just sort of started telling people what to do and hoping for the best. Um, and that actually worked out quite well. It was really fun. We had a lot of friends on board. And then uh, we also started planning the speaker lineup. So m and could get us a nurse. We could get ourselves a student. Um, and then we started individually texting physicians that we knew, um, even a little bit chaotically. I think we ended up paying a sketchy website to find somebody's phone number, but mostly we were uh, stopping at nothing to text physicians uh, to see if they would speak at this rally. Notably, it was interesting. I think there was a, a fair bit of hesitation amongst the Fairview physicians. They were uncomfortable with speaking out against their own um, organization. They were, uh, maybe this is because they're not unionized, uh, but I think there was a lot of hesitation over how that would be perceived. And so we ended up getting a retired physician who didn't have to worry about her job security uh, to speak at the rally, which was great. And she was fantastic. And then we were able to use connections through the MA and through just the U of M generally to get professors outside of the medical school to speak about labor, which was great. And then promotional materials. So obviously we sent out our rally information over email, but I really wanted to highlight our Instagram account. And I actually want to just show you what our Instagram account looks like. Um, so this is the Snap Instagram. You're welcome to follow us if anyone has Instagram. Um, but we... Uh, we set up like a series of videos of why students are going to the rally. So I wanna just show you a couple of them because I think it helped uh, garner a lot of energy around the rally. And once again, we were trying to make it seem like this is gonna be so fun. All of your friends are going and you should really show up too. So I'll show you one of those. Okay, I'm going because I believe patients should have equal access to good care, and that starts by changing the test with everybody. So. I'll show you one more too. Uh, this is this one's from Miranda. Hey, my name is Miranda, and I'm attending the rally this Friday to oppose the Sanford Fairview merger because historically, when healthcare systems like these consolidate, it ends up leading to the closure of rural hospitals and clinics they deem unprofitable. Contrary to Sanford's claims that they'll increase healthcare access, this will likely strip care and healthcare facilities from underserved and rural Minnesotans. Um, and while we're here, I'll also show you the video from um, from the hearing at the house, just to sort of emphasize that we're really trying to make it fun. And we were told after that video was made that we're not allowed to have signs in the in the house room, but that's okay. We we got away with it for the video. Um, but yeah, I think the Instagram was. Uh, just a fun way to get people involved and get people excited about it. And then we also needed signs and slogans. Once again, we used our connections. Um, my mom tends to hoard cardboard. So I was able to ask her for a lot of pieces of very uniform pieces of cardboard. Um, and my dad is really good at puns. And so I asked him if he could think of some kind of slogan or pun with corporate healthcare, Sanford, merger. And he said, what about purge the merge? I was like, great. So our whole rally was called Purge the Merge. Thank you to my dad. Um, and we assigned different sign makers to make sure that we had a, a, lot, a wide variety of signs with different slogans on them. Um, as for venue, we have access to the Health Sciences Education Center as students. It doesn't require a permit. And we wanted it to be near the hospital because we had branded our rally as a rally to save our hospital um, because we, we didn't really want to get into this is a rally to save us from going under corporate health care that would increase out-of-pocket costs for patients. Like, we didn't want to get into that. We wanted it to be clean and easily marketable. So we said, rally to save our hospital. It's going to be right outside the hospital. Come join us. Um, and then we also had to consider weather accommodations. It was actually the coldest day of the winter thus far. And this is where the piece about that, um, that physician we met at the SNAP conference donating to our rally, this is where that comes in. 
because he was able to provide money for hand warmers and coffee for everyone so that people could stay warm at the rally. And then we also had to get people to shovel snow the night before the rally. So we all, there was a med school frat uh, close to where we were having it. We recruited them with all of their snow shovels to, to clear walkways. And then we needed tech support. m and fortunately had a sound system for us. Uh, we did have a photographer friend who was gonna come, but his it was so cold that the camera didn't work. So we had everybody just take pictures on their phones. And then there was the press release, lastly. So we uh, used that Star Tribune article from the, the Minnesota House hearing to leverage some, <laughs> to, or like gain some credibility. And we reached out to CARE 11, CBS, Fox 9, all of these, um, and we were able to be featured in um, news articles and also just videos like on the news as well, which was great. So these are some pictures from the rally itself. There was a really good turnout. Um, my favorite of these pictures is Dr. Cross and holding a sign that says community need, not corporate greed. Love that. <laughs> Another sign had the uh, Fairview and Sanford CEO's salaries written on it, which is, I like to see that. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Um, and then you can see in this photo, all the students who helped out with the rally. So it really was like all hands on deck. A lot of students showed up to help um, organize, which was great. And then this uh, is just some screenshots of the, the news reports that came out of it, which is exactly what we wanted. We wanted legislators to be able to refer to these and say, look at how mad the U of M medical students are about this merger. Um, so we're glad that we got a wide array. Uh, the one in the Minnesota Reformer was especially wonderful. They did a great job. Um, I would highly recommend that you check that out. Uh, that's the one in the bottom left. And then after the rally, just moving along that timeline again, um, the rally and all the publicity around it opened up opportunities to meet with elected officials. So we met with Senator Omar Fateh. Um, we have a meeting actually tomorrow with Robin Wansley from Ward 2. Uh, and then this is a screenshot of us meeting with Attorney General Ellison. Uh, at this point, this was a couple days before his office came out with their decision. And he was largely on the same page as us anyways. <laughs> but it was nice to meet with him and, and confirm that. Um, and then we also wanted to get back to supporting the Minnesota Health Plan. Of course, we've been a little bit derailed by the uh, by the rally, but this is us with HCAM folks, some of you all um, supporting the the resolution in support of the Minnesota Health Plan at the Minneapolis City Council, which was great. And then most recently, just on Tuesday, um, we had another opportunity to testify in front of the Senate. So it was a similar uh, situation as testifying in front of the House. But again, we just vocally opposed the, the fairview Sanford merger. Only this time it was a little more intimidating because former governors Mark Dayton and Tim Pawlenty were also there, but they were on our side. So that was helpful. Um, and what's really exciting is that we're at this point in the year where second year medical students are transitioning into studying for this really big board exam. We're about to go off into clinicals, but we're able to involve first year medical students. So this guy, Colin, who testified on Tuesday is a first year medical student. And what's more, he's actually joining the PNHP summer internship along with five other first year medical students in the summer. So this whole cycle will, will start over again. And the second year med students really aren't going anywhere. We cannot morally separate ourselves from this movement. So we're just adding more and more students to this advocacy and to this, um, this SNAP chapter, which is really exciting. And then going forward, um, just a little bit about our to-do list moving on from here is, uh, again, the fairview Sanford merger discussions are not over. <laughs> so we're gonna obviously be doing more around that. We're meeting with Robin Wansley tomorrow to talk about how we can support her in, in uh, supporting the Minnesota Health Plan. We're planning a labor teach-in with SDS, which is Students for a Democratic Society, which is an undergraduate organization. We're gonna be talking about the importance of unions in healthcare. Um, we're also hoping to have a little bit of a say on the Board of Regents delegates. So we've been working with the Teamsters, which is a major union um, on campus to, uh, to be more vocal about who we'd like to see on the Board of Regents for the hospital. And then uh, we've been thinking about having like a uh, inter, not interprofessional, but a, a, a cross institutions. We wanna collaborate with another medical school to have a prior authorization workshop so that students can practice filling out prior authorizations, see how God awful it is, and then realize that they should really be pushing for a system that doesn't require prior authorizations. 
So um, before I close, I just want to reiterate those three key learning points. We really learned how to use our connections, whether it was MNA, HCAM, PNHP, my family, um, our friends. That was really important. Seizing the moment, just saying yes to hearing, saying yes to meeting with elected officials, saying yes to all these different things, and then figuring out how to do it after we said yes, um, and then making it fun and easy. And that was really exemplified in our um, Instagram campaign and just like bringing on a bunch of friends into the movement uh, to make sure that people weren't stressed by joining the movement, but really were just here to have a fun time and that SNAP could take on the organizing pieces of it. So that's all I have. Um, I'm happy to take any questions and thanks so much for listening. Wow, I'm out of breath, Allison. <laughs> that was amazing. We have we have at least 15 minutes for people who would like to uh, ask questions. And I think Jen and Judy, I'll let you um, kind of manage the, the, the Q&A portion. Um, do we want to take slides down and put screens up, perhaps? We can do that. Okay. And okay. Um, I Perfect. will call on people. So please uh, use the reaction tab on the bottom of your screen and use the raise hand feature. Um, if you just raise your hand in the screen like this, I will likely overlook you. Um, so please use that raise hand feature. And once I call on you, you're welcome to speak. Uh, Dr. Crossan. We can't hear you, Dr. Crossan. But you're not on mute, so I don't know. Let's try. Can you I try think and he needs to lower his uh, microphone on oh. his headphone? Yep, the microphone you on your lower headset. your microphone on your head headset. The microphone is sticking up, and you need to move it down. Mm -mm. Other side. Yep, it's on your right side, John. Oh. <laughs> Can't hear you still, Dr. Crossan. <clears throat> I would bet the headset is still connected. Yeah, can you unplug the headset? Still can't hear you. I don't know what's going on. Um, how, how about we go to Mark? Oh, yeah. I hear him now. Oh, okay. So, uh, Allison, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say that uh, I am often in contact with uh, people on uh, AM 950, and this is the progressive uh, uh, pro program for, uh, you know, all progressive movements. And right after the rally, I called in and got on the Mark uh, uh, McNeil's show, and I had a long discussion with him about the rally, and he's uh, he has been talking about this, and so I had another opportunity uh, after that to to advertise what you guys did, which was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for being there and for teaching me literally everything I know about superior healthcare. So, thanks, Doctor Cross and Mark. Hi. Um... That was very good, Allison. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to let you know, I believe that a recent ex-legislator, Hunter Cantrell, is going to be a freshman at uh, medical school next year and would be an obvious candidate to uh, recruit for SNAP. He's a progressive guy and a big single payer supporter from everything he says on Twitter. And uh, it seems to me he also under, knows people in the legislature. You stay close to a number of people and would be an, an enormous ally for you in uh, your efforts from now on. Can you put his name in the chat and I'll put it in our SNAP group chat? Yeah, absolutely. Sounds great. We will definitely recruit him. <laughs> Thank so, you. Just so you know, Mark is going to, or I mean, Hunter Cantrell is going to be our presenter on April 13th um, yes. for um, organizing and building our basic support. Throwing that in. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Mark. Rose? Um, Allison, absolutely fantastic. Like I said, you all are just uh, a breath of fresh air and giving us hope and life uh, in this movement. A um, couple of things. Uh, Hunter Cantrell is also a cancer survivor and has struggled, struggled through this system. 
And that is part of why he is so dedicated to this issue. Uh, he also worked for m and for the last uh, year, year and a half. So um, very excited that he's going into the field. I just wanted to note on uh, the labor teach-ins, uh, we're in it, we're on it. So as the national coordinator for labor campaign for single payer, I am, I've been, I'm, I'm going to get in touch with Shireen Horzak, who is the president of the AFSCME local that uh, represents uh, workers over at the University of Minnesota. And we would love to be able to be involved in doing a teach-in around why labor needs to be more at the forefront of the healthcare justice movement. And we need to stop thinking we can bargain, you know, health benefits and letting our employers control our access to health care. That's just nuts. Um, so uh, let's get in touch with each other and work on that because there's one uh, scheduled, I think, at U of M and another one at Metro State. And I definitely uh, want to work with you all on that. So just wanted to mention that. I was going to email you tonight, so I'm glad that this happened. <laughs> Great. Judy, you're muted. <laughs> Usually the space bar works, but for some reason it wasn't today. Thank you, Rose. Um, any other questions or comments? Excuse my dog barking. Don or is it? All right, I had a, I had a moment of bravery and then backed out. <laughs> um, thanks so much for your talk. Um, I, I feel like a little bit of an oddball out here. I'm. Uh, rehab psychology postdoctoral fellow and the things that you talk about come to me in that trickle down you know effect I, I get a patient that will come in and say I'm waiting on this medication I don't know what's happening or I've waited x amount of weeks or months and like I'm in pain I'm suffering and um, I'm on the tail end putting an emotional band-aid on it um, and I wish I heard about things like this sooner um, I wonder if there's you know resources or ways to connect um, like allied professionals and mental health or other healthcare fields um, to get involved in this sooner. You know, I'm I'm learning about these things now, um, and I've been in this for a hot minute. So, um, yeah, I wonder if you can uh, share any resources for me to spread the news. One thing I'll say, I think PNHP, which is Physicians for a National Health Program, is also trying to maybe call itself providers for a national health program. Um, and it welcomes people who are not physicians. Um, and there's a you know, Minnesota chapter that's really active as well. And then Healthcare for All Minnesota, anyone can join that. <laughs> but uh, I think there are people on this call who are better equipped to talk about joining HCAM than me. <laughs> but Great to see you this evening, Sean. Um, we get on mailing lists and you'll get more invitations than you can even handle for, <laughs> for uh, uh, events. So, and we will have in-person volunteer events uh, coming up as the weather gets better. And, and John, I put my, uh, this is Rose Roach, uh, chair of HCAM. I put my uh, email or yeah, my email address in the, um, in the chat, feel free to reach out to me and we will figure out ways to plug in and, you know, get you information, talk about your different, you know, the organizations you might be involved in this whole issue around, you know, mental health needs and everything that the crisis going on in this country. Um, we absolutely need to get better connected to that part of the health healthcare movement as well. So please, 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 um, you know, reach out to us because we definitely want to bring you into the fold and, and provide you whatever resources we can um, and, and help you out with this. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I don't see her email in the chat, but um, I'll email you back. Yep. You're connected, John. Um, and welcome to everybody. I, I may not have mentioned this. We're so, sort of used to um, preaching to the choir, but welcome to everybody who is new this evening, joining us for the first time. We really appreciate you um, signing in and hope that you will st uh, stay with us and watch for invitations from Healthcare for All Minnesota, Physicians for a National Health Program, get on the mailing list for Students for a National Health Program as well. Um, and uh, there's plenty of work to do, believe me. Um, this is only going to get uh, busier until we get this fixed. Um, we have a few more minutes if anybody has questions for Allison. Um, and otherwise, we will go to Jen Crawford, Executive Director of Physicians for National Health Program, Minnesota. Yeah. Um... 
I I think the National SNAP Group was going to be meeting with the AMA this summer and and Ooh. trying to get them to uh, support uh, uh, the the Minnesota or the, uh, the the National Medicare for All. Do you have any more information on that, Allison? Yeah, so the the AMA is meeting in Chicago in June, and I think a bunch of people are thinking of driving out there. There's also been, and this is a little bit that feels icky, but there's uh, been an, an ask amongst the National SNAP chapter to have a bunch of SNAP students join the AMA so that we have voting power. And I know, like, Dr. Cross, I know you've said, like, I've never joined the, M the AMA, and I want to be just like that. But Tragically, I just had to submit my <laughs> my <laughs> membership to the AMA so I could vote. Um, but I promise I'll cancel it after I vote. Uh, but that's been one of the <laughs> one of the asks. So hopefully, we're able to vote in favor of neutralizing their their language against single payer. Great. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Uh, any uh, last call for questions for Allison? And if not, thank you so much. You inspire all of us. Uh, truly, we want this. We want the future of healthcare to be better. Um, I a, a lot of us are of the age where we've lived through the healthcare as a business um, descent into profit taking over patient care, and we are desperate to change that. And we know we need. Um, uh, young people to uh, help with that um, effort. Uh, Jen, do you want to go ahead and talk about the summer intern program? Sure. Thank you, Allison, so much for sharing with us tonight. Um, uh, my name is Jen Crawford. I am the executive director of Physicians for a National Health Program of Minnesota. Um, we are the Minnesota chapter of the national group. Um, and I just back to Allison. Um, she's so inspiring, and I'm just so proud to know you um, <laughs> and to have worked with you and to see all the things that you've done this year. It it brings a tear to my eye, actually. Um, so proud. Um, <laughs> you might recognize Allison from volunteer events that we had this past summer. Um, so Allison, as she mentioned, was one of our um, summer interns. Uh, this past summer. Every year, Physicians for National Health Program Minnesota has a seven-week program where we take first-year medical students and we have an in-depth, concentrated study on the basics of single-payer, what it will mean for them in their future careers. We get them connected with physicians, um, with politicians, legislators, activists from across the country, and we really try to give them a an all-encompassing education about healthcare financing and the reform that is needed um, to, to make this country a better place. And it's so great when you were talking about, Miranda actually um, was one of our interns as well in her video that you showed and she was talking about rural America and hospital conglomeration. It, it brought me back to this past summer and it's just, it's wonderful to see what you guys have taken and bloomed with that knowledge that you were given. Um, I'm gonna put in the chat right now um, a sign up for our newsletter. And also um, I'm gonna put in there a link to donate. Our summer student program um, has its own fund and that fund is what we use to give stipends to our students because for those seven weeks, they're working on individual projects. They're reading multiple hours per week. Um, they're meeting with legislators. They're talking to activists and they can't have a job at that same time. So we try to pay them for their time what we can. We're running a deficit this year. And so if you feel moved and you are able, we would be very thankful for your donation to our 2023 summer internship program and moving uh, you know, along. If you'd ever consider being a sustaining donor, we would absolutely appreciate um, you doing so. So we can continue this important program. We are growing future leaders for our movement who are gonna make this change happen. And so um, that is in the, in the chat. You'll find that it's a secure encrypted link 
Um, you can make a one-time payment or you have the option to make a sustaining donation, which is just a monthly donation. And we thank you so much. And Allison, again, high five, nice job. Great presentation tonight. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Jen. Um, thanks, Allison. Um, next up, we have um, an, a crash course in what's happening at the state capitol this session. You wouldn't know it by the news, but there is actually a lot going on in the area of health policy, health care, um, work toward um, sort of building what we need to move toward the, the, the solution we want. Um, when you get your slides at the um, post meeting um, email, you'll see um, a slide that says that has our Healthcare for All Minnesota legislative priorities. That's, um, but we're not gonna cover that this evening. I'm going to bring uh, Rose back up to um, give us an overview of what's going on at the Capitol. Wonderful. Thanks again. And so, as I mentioned earlier, um, it, we got ahead of the legislators this year by letting them know on behalf of HCAM what kind of legislation and uh, we wanted them to prioritize. So um, those were those priorities were sent to the Minnesota House uh, and Senate as well as the chairs, the leaders of the House and the Senate, as well as the chairs of the House and Senate Health Committees and chairs of the Minnesota Health Plan Caucus. Um, HCAM recommended the legislature prioritize work on bills according to how close they come to the Minnesota Health Plan principles of one, a single payer, two, hospital budgets, three, uniform fee schedules for doctors, and four, drug and price controls and other me measures designed to contain costs. So number one, we said, let's put together a primary care case management and direct contracting bill that would directly pay health providers, nurses, social workers, counselors, physicians, et cetera, not insurance companies for coordinating care to medical assistance in Minnesota care enrollees. Contract with managed care plans for administering these programs it would not be renewed. So right now, you know, most of our government, our public health programs, both nationally as well as in the states, are actually being run <laughs> by um, and overseen and handled by managed care organizations. We do not need them in the middle of our health care. They're superfluous. It's time to get, as I often say, the money changers out of the temple. We don't need them there. They're sucking up precious health care dollars. We don't know where they're going, other than we know they're not going to actual health care and the providers um, who are providing that care. Um, we also think that a primary care case management and direct contracting would allow uh, savings for taxpayers' dollars, and it would improve coordination and quality of care for the enrollees and allow them a choice of providers that would not be confined by the HMO networks. We also told them we wanted them to do a cost study, an analysis of the cost of the Minnesota Health Plan compared to the current for-profit health insurance market to show savings from reduced insurance billing, marketing, and underwriting costs, reduced prices on drugs and medical services, and reduced administrative costs to businesses and government. We wanted them to take a look at prescription drugs. The, the, um, excuse me, the legislatures in the states have a lot. They, there are things that they can do. They could uh, put together a prescription drug accountability commission bill to have the powers to investigate, review, and publish information on drug prices and to hold drug companies accountable for unreasonable and unlawful pricing practice that would include being a watchdog on the pharmaceutical industry to serve as an advocate for patients, to eliminate anti-competitive practices that allow for continuous drug price hikes as well well as rebates that cause pharmacy bills and insurance rates to go up, including rebates that consumers never see, and the price hikes from patent modifications that improve the pharmaceutical company's profits, but not the drug's efficacy. And then using Minnesota's buying power to import for widely used drugs at affordable prices that are comparable with global rates, including insulin, EpiPen, Truvada, and 
naloxone. I'm not, a, I'm not a provider, as you all know, so I don't know if I said that correct, correct but um, I think that's basically Narcan, Narcan right? Mm -hmm. um, very, correct. very important with the opioid epidemic uh, that uh, folks are still suffering from. We also recommended that they take on the medical industrial complex directly, and they start to regulate them, do some insurance rate regulation. Again, lots of power for state legislatures to regulate insurance industry. Eliminate cost sharing, which shifts the financial burdens on to patients and implement public oversight of hospital closures to make hospital systems accountable to the community. Um, and it's meant to serve particularly that, that, that the hospital is meant to conserve, particularly when attempting to close those facilities or enter into these corporate mergers. And of course, we asked to reintroduce the Minnesota Health Plan so as to ultimately achieve administrative efficiency and elimination of the costly insurance bureaucracy with its underwriting, marketing, and CEO salaries and stock options, annual budgets to replace the costly task of itemizing, patchwork billing, and collecting individual expenses, bulk purchasing of drugs and medical supplies, and fairly negotiated provider fees. You are the ones who are providing the care, not the CEO of United Health. You should make the money, not him. Based on these recommended legislative priorities, HCAM is pleased to support the following bills that actually got introduced and align with our principles and goals to recognize health care for the human necessity that it is. Cover everyone, lower costs, increase quality, and delivery of care by decreasing health disparities, particularly racial health disparities, based decisions about the opening and closing of hospitals and clinics on community health needs and not the corporate health industry's bottom line, thereby saving lives. So here they are. Again, you will get all of this information, but you're welcome to try to write it down, but I only have so many minutes, so bear with me. <laughs> um, House file, 816 Senate file 404. These bills allow Medicaid recipients to opt out of the confines of managed care and allow them the choice to move to a fee-for-service uh, model, broadening the providers they can choose to get their care from. This begins to deprivatize medical assistance, which is our Medicaid program here in Minnesota. House File 1030, Senate File 1264, which eliminates enrollee cost sharing under medical assistance and Medicare, prohibiting also individual, small group, and state employee group insurance program plans from including cost sharing. Huge. This could be a game changer. House file 1095, Senate file 896, allowing undocumented, undocumented non-citizens to participate in MinCare. This is a no-brainer, should be done without any problems whatsoever. Hopefully this will pass this time. Senate file 1771, House file 1843. Senator Marty and Representative Liz Ryer's cost study bill, which is comparing the current complex fragmented system to the Minnesota Health Plan, a system that streamlines the financing of health care through administrative savings, redirecting health care dollars to actual care, which expands the system to cover everyone, individuals, families, businesses, and government, and does so more, much more cost effectively. House file 1790, I'm sorry, I don't currently have the uh, Senate file companion, but I have no doubt there is one, prohibiting pre-existing condition limitations in Medicare supplement or gap insurance policies. This is a big deal because right now when you go on Medicare, and you shouldn't go on Medicare Advantage because that's the privatization of our Medicare system that we cannot allow. Um, so you go on traditional Medicare, but it's an only an 80-20 plan, meaning that it only pays 80% of the cost. You have to pick up 20. So senior citizens and, and the disabled that are able to go on Medicare have to buy gap insurance plans. Well, guess what? If you start out in Medicare Advantage and you get cancer, and it turns out that that Medicare Advantage plan isn't going to pay for everything that you need as far as treatment goes under that for, for your cancer, which is happening, by the way. You decide, well, I'll just go back on traditional Medicare when open enrollment happens. That's fine. You can get back on there. But right now, that gap insurance plan that covers that other 20% can actually claim you have a pre-existing condition and not cover that cancer treatment either. So we need to fix that. There are a couple of other states that have done this, and I'm really pleased to see Minnesota jumping on this bandwagon to take care of that particular 
excuse me, loophole in the gap insurance policies. House file 402, Senate file 1681. This bill simply states, this is the bill, if a health system that is organized as a charitable organization and that includes M Health Fairview University of Minnesota Medical Center sells or transfers control of to an out of state nonprofit entity or to any for-profit entity, the health system must return to the general fund any charitable assets the health system received from the state. This is getting to what Allison was saying earlier, the bill that they that the students um, and many of our partners are testifying in support of. Uh, Robert Bierman, Representative Bierman is, is, the spot, um, is the author in the House. We must make hospitals accountable to the public so as to return them to being the community asset that they're meant to be. There are multiple bills that are focused on regulating the pharmaceutical industry. HealthCam has not yet taken a position on those bills, but we are pleased the legislature understands the importance of dealing with the high cost of life-sustaining and life-saving drugs and is working to rein in price gouging while increasing public oversight of the pharmaceutical industry. And hot off the presses, the Minnesota Health Plan has been reintroduced as of yesterday. Senator Marty sent me a text. It is Senate file 2740. The House author will be Representative Liz Ryer. She has 35 co-authors already and should have a bill number by next Monday. Senator Marty has the required five co-authors for Senate file 2740, but he is continuing to collect more and more co-authors every day for what they refer to as the clone bills, um, so that he is hoping to get back up to the three quarters, if not 100% of the DFL caucus signed on to the Minnesota Health Plan. All of these bills are very important in building the infrastructure that we need for implementing the Minnesota Health Plan, a healthcare system that centers patients and pro uh, providers, not corporate profits. I want to say a word about House File 96, Senate File 49. This is the MinCare expansion buy-in public option bill. The bill um, has elements that we absolutely support, like covering the undocumented and striving to provide a more affordable health plan coverage uh, option for small businesses and farmers. However, HCAM has recommended that the bill be amended to make it very clear that the Minnesota Care Public Option is indeed a fully public uh, plan with no involvement of the HMOs or any kind of privatization schemes imposed on it, which currently is not the case in the bill. HCAM is also concerned about the lack of specificity related to exactly how the public option would be structured, what it would cost the individual patient, small business owners in the state, how the public option will guarantee that there will be no adverse selection taking place. And this means that, the, that we want to make sure that the private market insurers won't be allowed to what we call cherry pick and insure only the healthier patients and avoid covering the sicker patients, ensuring that those patients end up in the public option, which will then, of course, cause the public option to have a much higher percentage of patients needing and using health care, which in turn will drive up the cost of that public option. HCAM at the end of the day is focused on a healthcare system that we know via numerous studies and examples from around the world will cover everyone, save money, improve quality, and most importantly, save lives. And that's the Minnesota Health Plan. So that is where our major focus is um, going forward. And we are also hoping that at some point, possibly they will do at the very least an informational hearing in one, one or more of the uh, committees of jurisdiction addiction, meaning we can all show up and support the Minnesota Health Plan and testify in support of that going forward. Thank you. <laughs> I know it's a lot, but trust me, you're going to get this some other way as well. And we can take some questions, I think, if needed. <laughs> right. <laughs> um. Thank you so much, Rose. Yes, we will send out this summary uh, with our post uh, meeting um, email. And but we do actually have maybe five minutes for questions before I introduce Dave. Sure, Mark. Uh, Mark, yes. Mark. 
So um, first of all, I put in the chat the companion bill to House File 1790. It's 14, SF 1486. Thank you. So um, that's got a single co-sponsor, um, but it's, and it has not a hearing yet. Um, okay. The, um, the other thing is I spoke to the chair of the Health Finance and Policy Committee, um, and um, I think there's a very good chance that the uh, study bill um, will be included in her omnibus. I think so too. Um, there, it's and Senator Marty is also very um, positive about that. Of course, Senator Marty is the chair of the Finance Committee in the Senate uh, this year, which it will hit that committee as well, since it, it has a cost attached to it. So we're very excited and very uh, positive um, in regards to the fact that we think this is going to actually pass this year, and we're finally going to get a study that will tell us how much money do we need to implement in the overall system of the Minnesota Health plan compared to all the money we're wasting in the current system, then we can get down to brass tactics and figure out exactly where that money is going to come from. And answer that age old question, <sighs> how much is it going to cost me? <laughs> right? <laughs> and we do need to do that. <laughs> so we're excited about that. Thanks, Mark uh, Lebo. Uh, for people who are on this call, Mark Lebo is um, married to uh, Representative Tina Liebling, who is the chair of the uh, Health the House Health Finance and Policy Committee. Is that right? Yes, she has a little correct. inside track. That's uh, why I speak to her on a regular basis. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and yes. um, I, I have to say, she has been awesome. <laughs> I mean, absolutely awesome. Yeah. I am such a fan of Tina's. Uh, this year, she is really taking on that industry, and it's so wonderful and refreshing, and I so appreciate her leadership. So uh, fearless. I have to throw in that <laughs> thanks to everybody who did work on this uh, election in 2022. We would not be here without, um, you know, re regaining uh, that tiny little majority in the state Senate and our holding on to our majority in the House. And honestly, we need to let everybody know that Rose's work behind the scenes is invaluable. You know, it's kind of all about networking and contacts, and that's helping us a lot. So we're feeling a little kind of optimistic and we got to 2024 hold on to these gains because it's all a building up to the actual solution that we want. Um, so uh, let me just um, give Dave Garibaldi a, a, a minute or two to talk about one of the ways that we're trying to build support um, for this, um, you know, universal uh, single payer financing for healthcare in the state of Minnesota and nationally is via a, a something called the City Resolutions Project. Uh, Dave Garibaldi's activist and board member with Healthcare for All Minnesota with Don Pilkinen, who is our secretary treasurer and um, board liaison for the legislative committee, has also taken a leadership position or a leadership role, I guess you would say, in um, pushing for these uh, city council resolutions around Minnesota. So um, for the Minnesota Health Fund and Medicare for All. So Dave's going to give us an update on recent activities. Uh, so Dave, do you want to turn on your screen if you haven't already? And I'm on. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you, Anne. Uh, first of all, I want to point out it's kind of a cruel joke putting me right behind Allison and Rose Roach, but <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, just can count this as your wind down for the night as you're getting ready to sleep. <laughs> uh, the local government resolution campaign's purpose is to get endorsements by city councils and county boards statewide. We ask local officials to encourage their state and congressional legislators to enact single payer legislation and convey local government support to the public. A single payer system would replace unsustainable costs of commercial health insurance, resulting in lower coverage for local government, Main Street businesses, residents, and taxpayers. We show city council members the savings derived by single payers lower payroll rates for the city employees health coverage compared to the higher commercial rates that cities are now paying. So the Minneapolis City Council recently endorsed the single payer Minnesota health plan 
to replace com their commercial insurance, hopefully at some point. Uh, this, they would, when we added them to this list, we now have uh, the, the largest and the second largest cities in the state and the fifth and sixth largest cities. So uh, this was on February 9th. I want to uh, thank Allison and the uh, SNAP students. Several of them made it out there to bolster our crowd on a weekday morning when most people can't make it out to these things. But we had a nice little showing and uh, it went really well with the Minneapolis City Council. Anne and I did a few uh, presentations to the council. Uh, they split them. There's 12 of them, so they were split into groups, and we we kind of let them know what this was all about. And uh, it went really well. Uh, we had unanimous and enthusiastic support for the resolution. And uh, seven city council councils have now endorsed the legislation and they represent a combined population of 1,029,237 people in the state of Minnesota. The other endorsing cities in order of size are uh, St. Paul, Brooklyn Park, Duluth, St. Louis Park, Brooklyn Center, and my little hometown here of Osseo which is proud to be the first small city to endorse. And that's it. Um, thanks so much, Dave. Um, if anybody out the, in, our, um, in our group this evening thinks that they are in an area that is kind of ripe for this effort, please contact Dave and Don uh, Pilkinen. Um, via, we, we can send their um, email addresses out. Well, I've got email addresses on the slides that you'll get from the meeting this evening, but there are lots of cities we'd like to, um, to uh, work on. I know um, activists with Healthcare for All Minnesota and Mankato are working to kind of encourage their city council members to consider this uh, this uh, resolution, this type of resolution. And we'd love to have people in central Minnesota, like St. Cloud area. So just be thinking about that. If you think your city, if you know somebody on your city council and you think we we could um, approach them, we have some experience. We have city council resolutions already written up. We have examples and templates. We have some training and you know, if we're gathering, we're kind of accumulating some experience in trying to explain how this would benefit um, local municipalities. And Thank you for saying that, Anne. I might just want to add that uh, these connections are priceless. Um, just like Allison was saying, to utilize connections is is a big deal. It's it's how I've participated in getting four of these done, and it just happen to be people that I know or somebody who knows somebody who's a council member. And you know, is kind of progressive. We can approach them, and then then it just takes off from there. It takes some time. I think these last three were a year in the making, but mm -hmm. uh, that's how you do it. And uh, I encourage you by all means to contact me if you know of a city council member that might be have a tendency to want to do this. Mm -hmm. One thing we do at the end, um, we, we ask that the city council actively support this work with us at the legislature. So I think that's one of the keys as far as we don't want a resolution that they put on the shelf in their council room. We want um, action from these city councils. So that's what we're trying to do is get a commitment from them to work with us, with the legislator and help lobby this issue, these issues when they come up. So, um, Okay, I have some announcements. Um, I've been working with um, our education and outreach efforts for um, all the time that I've been involved with Healthcare for All Minnesota. And I wanted to let you know what's coming up. Um, I, I always start by encouraging everybody to engage with our social media platforms. We could use a lot more um, effort with um, uh, actively engaging with our uh, YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Instagram, and Twitter. Please uh, like and share events, especially when events like this come up. 
please um, put this out to your personal networks and your followers. Um, continue to call, write, and respond to action alerts as you get them uh, during the month. We've got a couple of calls to action to follow this. Um, these announcements. Our next educational event will be Thursday, April 13th at 6.30 p.m. I, I mentioned that Hunter Cantrell is going to be, will be our, our featured speaker and our, our um, the theme for the event is organizing and building our base of support. It's going to take an enormous amount of public support to, to uh, push for the political will to make the change that we want. Um, and that's what we are really all about, is educating the public, organizing and building our base of support, and then working with legislators to, um, to work on the legislation for the change we want. So um, all of the educational events that we've done over the last three or four years are also on our YouTube channel, Healthcare for All Minnesota. So please check those out. And then please also read and share our monthly newsletter. And check the website. Um, Judy Barton, our um, um, director of operations, has done a lot of updating on the Healthcare for All Minnesota website. And Jen Crawford is working on the Physicians for National Health Program Minnesota website. Um, we have a number. We try to publish new articles. Um, also check the legislative page for legislative updates. That's a moving target, but we're trying to keep that up to date. Um, the Minnesota Health Plan has a website. Um, it's called mnhealthplan.org. Um, that's a great place to go for basic information for Senator Marty's book on uh, the um, common sense approach for a universal health plan and also uh, lots of frequently asked questions. And then um, Healthcare Now, um, which is more focused on the um, national Medicare for all, but a great source of, of um, education and training, is holding their annual strategy conference. It will be virtual, and it's April 17th through the 23rd. Uh, please go to um, healthcare-now.org um, to and click join the movement to get on their mailing list. And then uh, continue to watch our calendar, hca-mn.org, for other meetings and events. I do encourage people to support these organizations. All of us are working on pretty limited budgets, but um, Healthcare Now um, and Physicians for a National Health Program, both our uh, state chapter and pnhp.org is an absolute wealth of information. I really encourage getting on their mailing list. Um, it's not that expensive to uh, be a dues paying member. You do not have to be a physician to join pnhp.org. They have an excellent, they send out an excellent newsletter now quarterly and do a lot of work in between. They have really taken the lead on, on um, trying to inform Congress about the, the utter absolute fraud that is embedded in uh, Medicare Advantage. And so that's, it's great to have that organization to um, to, to tie our efforts to and um, become more informed and more active on, try, on trying to push back on privatizing our public program, um, Medicare, our public program for seniors and the disabled. So that's my pitch for, um, you know, <laughs> being engaged with all these organizations. And of course, since Don isn't, we didn't, we didn't um, include Don to do a, a donate uh, to Healthcare for All Minnesota pitch, but I might as well throw that in while I have the floor here. Uh, Healthcare for All Minnesota, uh, you can go to our website and hit the donate button there also. And then we do need our your, your help to spread the message. So uh, these are the social media sites and please uh, consider setting up accounts if you don't already have them or uh, using our social media to amplify our, our work. Then I've just got a couple slides at the end with references and resources that you can have that will come out with the, the post-meeting slides. And again, we are asking you to take action on two important issues this evening. First of all, my, I, 
I'm going to ask you to be a citizen lobbyist. Um, we did an educational event in February, which is on YouTube on how to be a citizen lobbyist. And now that you're more aware of some of the legislative proposals introduced this cycle, making their way through the process at the legislature this session, I ask all of us to take the opportunity to be citizen lobbyists. Call, write, visit your representative and senator, and advocate for the most important bills coming up this session. Um, you can find contact information on the Minnesota State Legislature website um, under who represents me if you're not sure who your representative and senator are or how to get a hold of them. Um, again, refer to our educational event on February 9th. And when you talk to, write to, or visit your, uh, your, your elected officials, identify yourself as a constituent, give some background about why you care about this issue, ask for their support, directly ask for their support, especially for the cost analysis bill that we would like pass this session and measures to reduce the influence of the commercial insurance industry on our public programs. Also ask them to co-sponsor the Minnesota Health Plan now that it's been reintroduced. And always offer to be a resource and an honest broker for this issue. We have a lot of information available to help you do that. Um, and, and ask me if you want me to send anything out. I also have, for anybody who's interested, I have um, business cards, postcards that you can use with our logo on to write to electeds. If you, um, when you get your post meeting um, slides and information, you can, you'll have my email address and you can ask me to send things to you in the mail, postcards, business cards, buttons if you want them. And I can also email um, handouts and information. Um, these are just a few more hints about being an, um, about effective interaction with uh, candidates and office holders, courtesy of my longtime and now retired Representative Dabney. I think that's all I had to say on this, and I'm going to ask Judy to do our next um, call to action. Great, thanks. So this is kind of like our monthly challenge. Uh, we encourage each and every one of you to just talk to one person about healthcare reform and what it means to you. That person can be a neighbor that you're comfortable with, a family member, a close friend, um, whoever you feel comfortable with. It's always great to start with somebody you feel the most comfortable talking to you with first and then building up from there. Um, you know, not everyone wants to speak to a stranger right away. Some people feel more comfortable speaking to a stranger first. So just think about one person in the next month that you can talk to about healthcare reform and see um, if you can get kind of a little light bulb starting to glow in their head on how this can benefit the state of Minnesota. Um, and then we've got some stuff coming up Friday. Dave, did you wanna to speak to this one? Sure. Uh, tomorrow night, um, Senate candidate from 2022, uh, Fario Khalif, has contacted me and uh, wanted to organize an, an event sort of focused on the in, immigrant com community in the Northwest Metro. And um, we put together this little event, but all are welcome. And uh, we are going to uh, be informing them of some of the legislation surrounding uh, immigrant issues, and in particular, the driver's licenses for all, which has been passed, I believe, and and also the uh, Minnesota Health Plan. We are going to talk uh, at length about that, and um, some of the other health care legislation, uh, opening Minnesota care to Im uh, undocumented immigrants will will be part of what we talk about. And uh, like I said, everybody's invited. We'll have some refreshments. This will be tomorrow night at six at the Maple Grove Community Center. And uh, the address is on the, the flyer that's posted there. That's 12951 Weaver Lake Road in Maple Grove. So, and Anne will be there okay. with me, hopefully 
yeah. doing the major part of the presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and, and working the technology, that's going to be my big challenge. Thanks, Judy, for your um, announcement or your call to action in line with our theme of um, action oriented uh, efforts going forward. And uh, this event is reminding me to say, we are looking for outreach opportunities. It, it isn't just up to the boards of Healthcare for All Minnesota and Physicians for a National Health Program Minnesota to suggest uh, effort uh, outreach efforts. We would like you guys to have your eyes and ears open for where we should be to be a presence, uh, be educating the public, uh, maybe setting up our uh, speaking opportunities or forums. We are open to suggestions. We have plenty of people, lots of information to share, people who are willing to come out and up uh, and present. So please um, offer suggestions and you can send them to our website email address um, or to um, email addresses you'll find on these slides. And then one um, event uh, or one um, issue um, being championed by uh, one of our partners, um, Copal. If Carolina is still on the call or Becky, did you? She and she I think, had I think a conflict. Becky, Becky okay. is here. Okay, go yes. ahead, Becky. I'll turn on my camera really quick. Okay, first and foremost, I want to present myself. I'm Becky um, here on behalf of Carolina Ortiz. Um, thank you all for allowing me to be a part of this space. It's been amazing to hear all the work that everyone's doing. And then, very quickly, um, so this. Um, action that's going on on Tuesday, March 14th at 3 p.m. is going to be about the cumulative um, frontline communities um, protection act um, that will be um, on March 14th at 3 p.m. And then also Carolina said if anybody was open to testimonies, um, please get in touch with her. Feel free to email her and I can throw her email in the chat really quickly. And if not available for that, um, also just showing up presence is key. And then lastly, um, also being able to submit a letter of support to the mm -hmm. Environmental and Natural Resources Finance and Policy Committee. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you, Becky. Great to meet you. We are on, we will be submitting a letter of support for this bill because the, uh, a health, healthy environment affects uh, health for all of us. Um, and you are an important partner. Um, thanks so much. Thank you so much. I I think we are at the end, even though it's snowing and winter doesn't seem to want to be done with us yet. I wanted to wish everybody a happy spring. It is March. Spring is coming. And I, um, <laughs> I have a question. Uh huh. Is there any, does anybody have any update on the ACO re reach program uh, the, within Medicare? <clears throat> well, um, very quickly, uh, the uh, apparently CMS Centers for Innovation, uh, Medicare Medicaid Services Innovation Center, which dreamed up this scheme, is not signing up any more profit profiteering uh, entities to this program. But it's not ended. So I would suggest going to pnhp.org, sign up to get their um, their um, emails, and stay in touch. They are really taking the lead on pushing back on this. Yeah, yeah Thank thanks you. for the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, any on. other um, questions before the, we uh, end this PNHP evening? PNHP National is doing a great deal to... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and a privatization of Medicare, which is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to go reach. So they're they're very active in this right now. Okay, uh, my uh, we are right on the money. Wow, <laughs> Jen and Judy, would you like to do a wrap up? Sure. Um, as a you know, usual, we will send out probably early next week the recording of this video, as well as the uh, materials that were presented, the powerpoints. Um, the handout with all of the bills that, and, uh, no, I'm sorry, Rose went over. Um, and so I look for that in your email. And if you have any questions, never hesitate to reach out to Healthcare for All Minnesota and we will get back to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great to see you all.
Love the energy in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good evening. Talk soon. Mm -hmm. 